For centuries, one of the most deep and contentious religious mysteries has been concealed in plain sight behind the ancient walls of Rome. This mystery has been a source of much controversy. Because of a discovery that was uncovered just a few years ago, our picture of early Christianity has been completely rewritten and long-held assumptions about the appearance of Jesus Christ himself have been called into question. A letter that is said to have been written by the Apostle Paul himself has been discovered deep beneath the bustling streets of modern Rome. This astonishing item was brought to light as a result of an unexpected discovery. Nevertheless, this is not your typical letter. A remarkable physical description of Jesus is described in the manuscript, which has been authenticated by prominent experts. This depiction stands in stark contrast to the depiction of Jesus that has been prevalent in Western Christianity for many generations, which depicts him as having fair complexion and European features. A portrayal of Jesus that is obviously non-European, with dark skin, shaggy hair, and broad facial features, is described by Paul in this letter. This portrayal has sparked a heated discussion and spurred a re-examination of the origins of the Christian religion. What are the reasons behind the fact that such a momentous discovery has been kept hidden for such a long time, and what does it say about the genuine ethnic identity of the most powerful religious figure in the history of the world? We invite you to join us as we uncover the specifics of this astounding discovery and investigate the enormous consequences it has for our comprehension of Jesus, the propagation of early Christianity, and the intricate web of human diversity that has defined our planet. During the summer of 2013, a group of Italian archaeologists were carrying out normal excavations beneath the streets of central Rome. These digs were taking place barely a stone's throw away from the famous Colosseum. With the remnants of multiple underground basilicas and tombs dotting the terrain, the location, which is situated in the valley of the ancient Tiber River, had been known for a long time as an important hub of early Christian activity. On this particular day, the excavators unearthed a remarkable discovery, a stone box that had been hermetically sealed and retained its contents for almost two millennia without being opened. An individual scroll made of parchment was found within, and the wording on it had miraculously been preserved by the airtight environment. When the paper was discovered, scholars instantly recognized it as an old letter written in Koine Greek, which was the language that was commonly used in the early Christian world. Subsequent to the meticulous preservation and translation of the scroll, the experts were taken aback by the contents of the scroll. It was determined that the letter was written by none other than the Apostle Paul, who was considered to be one of the most significant figures in the nascent Christian movement. On the other hand, the epistle's depiction of Jesus Christ was in direct contradiction to the conventional iconography that had been prevalent for generations. Man with unmistakable African traits was pictured in Paul's epistle. These features included dark skin, large lips, and tightly curled hair. This is in contrast to the fair-skinned, European-looking Jesus that is familiar to the majority of current Christians. In contrast to the image of the white savior that is portrayed in churches, artworks, and the popular imagination, this Jesus was a man who was very different from everyone else. In the realm of biblical academia, the discovery caused shockwaves to travel throughout the world. What were the implications of this discovery for our comprehension of the beginnings and early stages of the growth of Christianity, and how was it possible that such a profound picture of Christ had been concealed for such a long period of time? The authenticity of the parchment scroll was verified by a series of rigorous scientific examinations that were carried out in the years that followed the first excavation. The document was found to be within the lifespan of the historical Paul, who is thought to have lived in the first century CE, according to the results of the carbon dating. An examination of the Greek script via the lens of biography revealed that the handwriting was in agreement with other samples of Pauline epistles that are known to exist. Particularly noteworthy was the fact that the letter's substance and theological perspective were in close agreement with Paul's works that are considered to be part of the New Testament canon. The claimed authorship of the scroll was given more respect as a result of the fact that it contained references to specific events, figures, and doctrinal stances that were consistent with the Apostles' established body of evidence. On the other hand, the extreme portrayal of Jesus that was included in the epistle posed a substantial challenge to the consensus among scholars. Because the depiction of Christ in Europe had been so deeply ingrained in Christian iconography and tradition, many people were unwilling to accept a different version of Christ, regardless of how compelling the evidence was. 
The fact that the newly discovered letter appeared to contradict earlier canonical descriptions of Jesus' physical appearance was a factor that contributed to the debate that was already there. Each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, describes a Messiah who has characteristics that are characteristic of the Middle East, including olive skin, dark hair, and Semitic features. It is difficult to see how Paul's story could be so drastically different from these reputable sources in order to address these concerns, the study team sought the assistance of eminent experts in a variety of subjects, including art history, forensic anthropology, ancient history, and theology, among others. An argument that was compelling for the legitimacy and significance of the astonishing find started to develop as a result of the rigorous analysis that was performed. The question of why Paul's picture of Jesus was so drastically different from the portrayals found in the Gospels was at the center of the argument that taking place among scholars. The hypothesis that the Apostles' letter existed before to the canonical stories was one that was proposed by theologians. This would provide a more immediate and possibly more accurate representation of the historical Jesus. The proponents of this viewpoint contended that the Gospels, which were written several decades after the death of Jesus, might have been affected by the expanding Greco-Roman cultural domination of the Roman Empire. The iconography and imagery of Christianity may have been purposefully altered as the religion grew throughout the Mediterranean world. This may have been done in order to cater to the preferences and expectations of the religion's population, which was becoming increasingly diverse, on the other hand, Paul's letter, which was most likely written during the Apostles' missionary missions in the 50s CE, may be interpreted as a more unfiltered picture of Jesus, one that had not yet been sculpted by the necessity of cultural integration. Due to the fact that the Apostle asserted that he had a personal relationship with the Messiah, it is possible that he maintained a more genuine recollection of his physical appearance in order to lend additional support to this theory, forensic anthropologists conducted an analysis of the anatomical traits that were detailed in the letter. They came to the conclusion that these qualities were in line with the normal physical characteristics of people who were indigenous to the Levant region of the ancient Near East. The Europeanized images that would later come to dominate Christian art and iconography stood in stark contrast to this. Furthermore, Historians referred to evidence of diversity within early Christianity, focusing on the fact that the foundations of the faith were firmly rooted in the multicultural environment of the Roman Empire. It is important to note that the first spread of the Church was not restricted to the populations of Europe. Rather, it encompassed considerable communities of followers in North Africa, the Middle East, and even as far east as India. In this setting, a Jesus with African or dark features would not have been as shocking or contentious as it might appear to our sensibilities, which have been formed by centuries of Western cultural hegemony. It is therefore possible to interpret the description of the letter as a reflection of the organic development of the faith within the context of an ancient civilization that was internationally interconnected. The revelation of Paul's letter and the radical picture of Jesus that it contained have had significant repercussions for the comprehension of early Christianity and the development of the religion over the course of the centuries. A great number of people have had their long-held beliefs and deeply ingrained ideas about the ethnic identity of the religion's key figure destroyed as a result of the discovery. Perhaps most significantly, the letter has pushed a re-examination of the role that power dynamics, culture, and race have had in the formation of Christian theology and iconography. This is perhaps the most profound effect of the letter. Scholars have pointed out that the European representation of Jesus, which has dominated Western art and religious imagination for centuries, may have worked to strengthen colonial and imperialist beliefs that exalted white supremacy. This is something that has been observed by scholars. The Pauline text that was recently discovered, on the other hand, provides a startling alternative story. This narrative places Jesus squarely into the multicultural environment of the ancient Mediterranean civilization. The result of this is that there has been a resurgence in the investigation of the various origins of the religion and the manner in which it has been molded by the intricate interaction of cultures and ethnicities from all over the world. The news that Paul's letter was discovered has been a deep and empowering revelation for a great number of Christians particularly those who come from backgrounds that are not European. The long-held belief that the Savior of the world must be beautiful and divine in accordance with a Eurocentric norm is called into question by this piece of evidence. A Jesus who is firmly entrenched in the variegated tapestry of the ancient Near East is presented instead. This Jesus is a figure who transcends the limits of race and ethnicity, 
which have so frequently been used to divide and marginalize people. As the academic and theological discussion surrounding this astonishing discovery continues to develop, it is becoming increasingly apparent that the ramifications of the Pauline letter go well beyond the sphere of biblical studies. The continuous struggle for representation and inclusion, as well as the reclaiming of historical narratives that have been repressed or distorted by the forces of cultural hegemony, is reflected in this statement. One of the most significant finds from antiquity is this letter. Let us not waste any more time and dive headfirst into this letter and its rich descriptions of Jesus. If you're interested in being a member of this community and want to make sure you don't miss a video update, subscribing is a good idea. Even if there was someone unbeliever we could trust to teach us about Jesus, it would have been Saul. Paul became his new name once he encountered Jesus. Paul, often referred to as Saul, was a renowned Pharisee in training while Jesus was choosing his followers. He was aware of all that Jesus performed, but he saw it all as a farce because, well, you know the mentality of a Pharisee. Also, he promised that after he finished school, he would deal with him and his supporters. In Jerusalem, Paul was well-liked by his co-workers until he met Jesus, who changed his name on the way to Damascus. He was born to Jewish parents from the Benjamin tribe in the city of Tarsus in what is now Turkey. The educational and cultural influences on Saul's life came from Tarsus, a major city in the Roman Empire and a seat of learning. The cosmopolitan character of Tarsus meant that Saul was educated in both Jewish law and tradition as well as Greek philosophy and culture. His unusual background in Jewish scripture and Greco-Roman culture prepared him to connect with the variegated Eastern Mediterranean environment. Saul was a bright student of Jewish law and a devout follower of his father's traditions when he was a young man. He joined the Pharisees, a religious group renowned for its zealous commitment to God and stringent observance of the law. Even the disciples of Jesus, whom Saul had first thought were heretics, became targets of his fervent defense of Judaism. Saul was a major figure in the persecution of the early Christians because of his intense hatred of those who followed Jesus. In addition to being an eyewitness to the death of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, he played a key role in the arrest and incarceration of several other Jerusalem Christians. Saul traveled to Damascus on one of his expeditions. His objective was to locate any potential disciples of Jesus, apprehend them, and return them to Jerusalem to stand trial. He felt obligated to eradicate what he viewed as heresy as he considered them as a danger to the Jewish religion. A transformative meeting with the risen Jesus Christ, however, took place on Saul's journey to Damascus. Surrounded by a dazzling light from up high, he perceived a voice calling out to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? After this terrifying ordeal, Saul was taken to Damascus and kept company with Ananias for three days of fasting and prayer. At the same time, a follower of Jesus named Ananias who lived in Damascus had a vision from God telling him to go and heal Saul's blindness. The Lord had Ananias go to Saul, but he was reluctant at first because of Saul's reputation as a Christian persecutor. Nevertheless, Ananias followed the Lord. Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit and his sight was restored when Ananias prayed for him. The passage in question is Acts 9 verse 19. Saul underwent a radical change over this period. In a remarkable turnaround, he became one of the church's most vocal defenders after having previously opposed it. After having a life-changing experience with Jesus on the way to Damascus, he was baptized, received sight, and the Holy Spirit. Paul, whose real name was Saul, went on to become a major player in the early church. In his missionary travels around the Roman Empire, he preached the gospel to Gentiles and Jews alike. His writings, which constitute a large part of the New Testament, have had and will have far-reaching effects on Christian belief and practice. Many of the writings or epistles that make up the New Testament of the Bible were written by Paul, who is also called the Apostle Paul or St. Paul. The theological teachings, direction, encouragement, and correction were sent in these letters to different Christian groups and individuals. Paul wrote the Epistle to the Romans, which is a part of the New Testament, when he was in Rome receiving some of these letters. Paul lays out his thoughts on the gospel and what it means for Gentiles and Jews alike in this lengthy letter.
Both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul's writings to the church at Corinth, are part of the canonical New Testament canon. The Corinthian church is divided, there is immorality, there are litigation, and there are problems about spiritual gifts and marriage in these letters. Along with intimate correspondence with people like Philemon and Timothy, Paul also penned epistles to the churches in Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica. Because they provide light on Paul's teachings and the early church, Christians all around the globe continue to study and treasure these writings. Paul penned the New Testament book known as the Letter to the Galatians. Justification by grace alone by faith in Christ is the central theme of this epistle, which also deals with the problem of legalism. Paul authored the New Testament epistle to the Ephesians, which is housed at Ephesus. This epistle stresses the importance of Christians sticking together as one body and gives guidelines for how Christians should live their lives. Paul composed the epistle to the Philippians and put it in the canon of Scripture. Paul writes this letter to the Christians in Philippi to share his delight and gratitude for them and to urge them to be steadfast in their faith even if they are persecuted. Colossae Paul penned the New Testament book known as the Letter to the Colossians. In it, the author condemns Gnosticism and extols Christ as Lord. Paul composed two New Testament writings addressed to the church at Thessalonica. They are 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Paul writes these letters to the Christians in Thessalonica to encourage and advise them in their faith in Christ's coming and how to live their lives in anticipation of that day. Legend has it that Paul penned more letters that did not make it into the canonical New Testament collection. The validity and canonical status of these letters are questioned among academics, but some of them may be preserved in the hands of the Vatican in Rome. Still, more early Christian works exist outside of what is officially considered the New Testament canon. They are often called the New Testament Apocrypha or simply non-canonical texts. Several letters, Gospels, Acts, and Apocalypses written by people associated with the early Christian movement are included in these texts. Scholars dispute the authenticity and canonical character of several texts that carry the name of Paul and claim to have been authored by him. As the seat of the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican has a treasure trove of early Christian texts among its numerous antique manuscripts and papers. Even if these documents are preserved in the Vatican archives, it doesn't mean they are canonical. Letters to several churches, including Laodicea, Corinth, and Alexandria, as well as the Acts of Paul and Thecla, are among these texts. The one we'll be discussing today is Paul's Epistle to the Romans. Our own canonical gospel, contained in Acts, contains this. Upon seeing Jesus in the Bible, Paul made an immediate and contrite appeal to him. It explains that Paul heard his voice and saw him, but he couldn't place him. Why can't he see Jesus clearly today, even though he may have heard him speaking when Jesus was on earth teaching? Jesus, when he is exalted, resembles a blazing inferno whose luminous intensity obscures his true countenance. His voice, however sinful, is audible to you, though it reeks of a thousand streams. Because of this, he was unable to recognize the voice until he confessed that it was Jesus. If John truly saw Jesus as described in the book of Revelation, with woolly white hair, fiery eyes, bronze feet that glowed in a furnace, a voice like the sound of rushing waters, and a face that shone like the sun in all its glory, then he was not mistaken. The biblical account describes the companions of Paul who were able to hear the voice but unable to see due to their spiritual blindness, rather than physical blindness. Stay out of this blind spot, get yourself into a personal contact with God, and He will open your eyes to see God in all His grandeur. Any sin that has blinded you up until now will be cleansed away today. No matter how much you hate his followers, God will still love them. If you follow his path, you will enter everlasting glory. If you have faith in God and think he can make a difference in your life right now, then this is what you should expect. We should then say a prayer.